And welcome back to the Overtime here on WOTM. Mark, let's talk about the Atlanta Braves. This is a team that we've been following all year long. We knew that they had the talent after making a deep run in the playoffs last year. It looks to me right now, and you can kind of judge it based on their opponents. However, from a win-loss standpoint, they really found a groove. Now 62-56 and 56 overall, and now first place once again in the NL East, one game ahead of the Philadelphia Phillies heading into tonight's game. Swept the Nationals over the weekend in a three-game series. Yep. Did it in a low-scoring game, 1-4-2. Also did it in a high-scoring game with a 12-2 with a win uh, against the Nationals there. They've now won six of their last seven. This is a team and this is a position where you've kind of forecasted the Braves being able to make a run. It looks like they're kind of in the middle of that right now. I think everybody early on was panicking with Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Now, how they played early on was in, uh, indicative of the fact that their starters didn't go deep, their bullpen was getting overworked, and that's why you saw some of the inconsistency early on. Right. Then you had Ozuna's situation, and then you have Acuna's situation. Right. So not too many teams can lose two-thirds of their outfield, which, I don't know, put together probably 60 homers yeah. and 100, you know, 220 RBIs. Uh -huh. uh, that's not easy to replace, but they've managed to replace it and they still managed to survive some severe implosions from that bullpen, which is kind of a mixed bag. You don't know what you're going to get when you throw those guys out there. You can get dominance or you can get a, a total implosion. But I think these guys are starting to gel a little bit because of numbers. Right. So maybe they're not putting as much, they're not taxing it. Uh, each other as much as they did where they're pitching now every third, fourth day. Uh, guys are getting some rest uh, and being able to recover a little bit better. But definitely since August 3rd, Atlanta's been better on offense mm -hmm. and they've been better uh, pitching overall and their bullpen specifically. And I got some numbers to, to show you how that's that's been looking. So 10-2 and two over that time period. Now, they didn't play on August 2nd, so it's since, essentially since August 3rd. 10 and 2 over that time, averaging six runs a game, hitting the ball over the fence, 24 home runs over that time, and an OPS of 7.86 as a team. Right. Okay? That's yeah. pretty good for an individual. Exactly. Uh, but as a team. And I think that's something that people were waiting on. Mm -hmm. And this is without Acuna. Exactly. So uh, you need production from other places in the lineup. The Braves were able to get that, and I'll get to that in a minute from some of the other guys that they got at the trade deadline. The other thing is, pitching wise, Atlanta is doing much better than they were early in the season as far as, like I said, getting consistency out of that bullpen. They're only averaging 4.1 runs per game. Now, you might say that that's a lot, but again, we're only talking over a 12-game span. Exactly. Uh, and again, uh, a couple of one of those games, they had 12, they allowed 12 runs, a game that kind of got away from them, one of their two losses. Uh, their K to, bull, uh, to walk differential is plus 78. That is absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. for a pitching staff to have over that larger span, a 12-game span to have 78 more strikeouts than walks. Right. That's really indicative of how the Braves have been doing. Overall, their bullpen uh, opponent batting average is just 213 over that, and that includes that game. You take away that game, it's about 180 exactly. uh, where they allowed uh, 12 runs and their bullpen allowed nine hits right. uh, because they got extended. Uh, the bullpen whip, again, 1.19. Again, you take away that one game, it's almost around one. Mm -hmm. So th that real is, is a huge difference. Take away that one game, and we're talking about much better numbers, but still the numbers aren't that bad. And I think when you're looking at where this winning is coming from now, where this consistency is coming from, you know the pitching's better. This is what we've described. And some of the players that they've gotten uh, at the trade deadline is helping too, um, with, with Solaire and Duval. I'll get to those numbers in a second. But... The Braves infield, too, has yeah. been absolutely mashing the ball. Freeman, Osby, Albee, Swanson, Riley. These are all four infielders. Never before in baseball history have all the uh, first baseman, second baseman, third baseman, shortstop all had 30 home runs in the same season. Right. Only a handful of teams, about 12 teams, have had four guys with 30 home runs. Yeah. I mean, in 1997, Dodgers have done it. The 2000 Angels have done it. Uh, the Rockies did it when they had their teams. And even the Braves did it before. Uh, when they had uh, Javi Lopez and Chipper Jones and Andrew Jones and Andres Galarraga, okay? Um, so this Braves team could do something really special. The last team to have four guys uh, with 30 home or more home runs was the 2019 Twins, mm -hmm. who set the record with five guys right. with 30 home runs. They had eight guys with 20 home runs, and they lost in the, you know, the, the first round of the playoffs like they always seem to do uh, to the Yankees or somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can hit all these home runs and still not – 
do well in the postseason. Right, right. So that's just a warning it's not for, a correlation for the Braves. That, that yeah, just it's a good hitting well in the, in the infield in the regular season. That you're going to do the same thing in the postseason. Right, and, but I think this is a good indicator on how the the Braves have been doing and where their runs have been coming from with Acuna out. The other uh, place they've been coming from is Soler and Duvall, guys. They got at the trade deadline. Seven home runs, 17 runs scored, and 17 RBIs between them since they got them. Now, they, they don't hit for average. I mean, right. they're 235 and 204, but they are productive, yeah. and that's what you want. You don't care about batting average. It's saying, if you show it as a stat to kind of give a basis, but runs scored and runs driven in is what wins baseball mm-hmm. games. Uh, and Duvall and Soler are guys that know how to do it, and they've made a big difference for Atlanta since they've been acquired. You look at that compared to... The Mets acquisitions in, in the offseason, right. you know, Carrasco got lit up last night. Uh, you don't know uh, when Lindor's going to be back. Mm-hmm. DeGrom hasn't pitched since the All-Star game. These are key guys for the Mets, right. and they're nowhere to be found. The, and uh, Baez, they got at the trade deadline, he's not playing either. So you, you don't know what the Mets are going to do with their injuries. It seems like everybody gets like a soft tissue injury. So the Braves have been able to rebound from major injuries, m- major unexpected things like Ozuna and recover and still win. That's what good organizations do. And the Braves have a great organization. This is why they're winning. This is why I said they would win the East at the beginning of the year. And I think they're starting to run away with it. The Phillies lose four out of six to the Dodgers and the Reds. Once they start playing real teams again, they're not playing the Nationals and Mets anymore. Uh So I think uh, whenever they have to do that, the Phillies, I don't think are good enough. And the Mets certainly right now have too many injuries to be good enough. Exactly. It's a really good breakdown, and it's a team, like you said, that's won 10 of their last 12 games. Now, part of that has to be you, know, you figure in the competition. They've also they've played the Nationals in two series, mm-hmm. played the Reds, and they've played the Cardinals, but they're having a really, really, really strong run. It's a great breakdown of where they're kind of getting their production with two, definitely one of their players, their best player, now out for the year. We'll see how they go. We'll continue to track them as the season goes along. We'll also stay on top of the high school football scene. Coming up right here, we want to remind you on Thursday and Friday, we'll have live high school football for you. Gunnersville and Hanley, the number five team in Class 5A, the defending state champion in Class 4A, the number two team heading into the season. We'll do battle in a regular season contest on Thursday. Then on Friday, it is a 7A exhibition slash jamboree. Dothan and Bob Jones, two of the big boy schools, getting it all underway at the HSAA kickoff classic at Crampton Bowl in Montgomery. We'll come up next here on Overtime. We'll talk a little bit more football for you. A great day of debuts for rookie quarterbacks in the NFL. We'll break it down coming up next.